All right, so this evening, when we were preaching a sermon, there's actually a couple people brought this topic um, to me, and I thought it was a really good one. I haven't preached on this in quite a while, and that is the subject of the body, the soul, and the spirit. And um, I actually did a lot, a lot of, of study for this. Um, not that I had to figure out exactly what I believe about it, but just to, I really want to make sure I was being extremely comprehensive and um, there's a lot of nuance in this, and I'm not going to be able to get into too much nuance. And I'll start off just by saying this. When you do a study on something like this, a body, soul, and spirit, um, context matters a lot. <laughs> because as we're going to see briefly here, I'm going to go through each of these things. But references to the soul, and especially references to the spirit, what is meant by that actually matters, you know, the context matters tremendously. And, and just uh, a quick example, we'll get into this a little bit deeper. You know, when the Bible talks about the soul, oftentimes it's just referring to like a person, like just, just, so, you know, just uh, someone dying or someone doing something wrong and just referring to them as a soul. So whereas what I'm trying to speak about tonight is the fact that we consist of a body, a soul, and a spirit as created beings, right? As, as human beings that God created, we have three parts. There's a trichotomy that makes up every individual human being. So I'm going to try to cover that. But as you read scripture, you're going to find all different types of contexts about this, about you know, with souls, with the spirit, you know, there's a spirit of fear, there's a spirit of meekness, there's, a, you know, there's all these different things which don't necessarily apply to what I'm preaching about tonight. So when you're looking things up, of course, it's just another great opportunity to mention, get the context on everything that you read and everything that you're studying and everything you want to know about um, and not just grab verses because you think it might apply. You know, you, you, you make sure you understand what the context is talking about. It's very important. And for this sermon, I literally looked up like every, using, using a digital guide because there's a lot of, the, anytime the word soul or, or any derivative of souls you, soul, souls, or spirit, and there's over 500 references to both of them, uniquely. So it's like 1,100 verses. Now, a lot of them weren't things I was necessarily going to cover in the sermon, but I really wanted to be comprehensive. And here's where I wanted to be comprehensive about. This is, this is the fact-checking I was doing, because I'd, I'd heard someone say this before, and it sounded right on, it sounded true, but I kind of wanted to just verify that, yes, this is actually you know, with this in mind, what the Bible teaches. And it's, it's kind of a simplification of what, like why we even have the three parts of a soul, a body, and a spirit. And where am I even get this from is the passage we just read in verse number 23 there, First Thessalonians 5, the Bible says, And the very God of peace sanctify you holy, and I pray God your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless on the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. So right there, it's, it's, referencing three different parts. And, you know, some people will say that a soul and a spirit might be like the same thing, but they're not. And, and this clearly is, 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 we start off with this just because this verse is so clear on saying you have a body, you have a soul, you have a spirit, right? And when you're comparing verses, you might be able to say, see, look, the spirit and the soul are kind of just like the same thing if you just compare two verses that make them look like they're maybe doing the same thing or the wording's just kind of similar and in one place it says the spirit and one place it says the soul which is why you can't just when you have so many references to them too is just just take two random verses or whatever and and uh, see look they're the same thing no no they're not they're actually uh different they have their own purpose but the way that I've heard it said, and, and I agree with this assessment, is that, you know, of course, our body helps us in our dealing with the world around us, the natural world, the physical world that we just are dealing with on a day-to-day -day body, uh, a day-to-day -day, um, <laughs> body, day-to-day -day basis, okay? Our bodies interact with the world around us, right? Makes sense. Our soul is 
used in a communication with man, with mankind, with other people, having personal relations with people in general. And then our spirit is with our communication and our relationship with the Lord, with God. Right? So spiritual things are things that would be like religious things, things that have to do with God. And every creature is made up of these three parts, right? So it's not just saved people. Of course, unsaved people, too, have this religious nature, religious part of them, this aspect. They have a spirit, right? But they may worship a false god. They're just religious in different ways. People get religious about things. It's a spiritual side of them. And some people, they don't say, oh, I'm, I'm just spiritual. I don't have any religion or whatever. But that would come from the part of them that is the spirit, right? The, the, the soul is dealing with, like I said, other people, other human beings around you and having that interpersonal relationships. And then the body, of course, just in general, your senses, your, your sight, your smell, your, your touch, your taste, you know, all that stuff um, is what the body is for. Now, it, it, th that being said, it is a pretty vast simplification about these things, right? It's, it's just a good way, I think, to kind of help you think about things and, and understand it a little bit. Um, but when you dig into scripture, it's, that's just, it's not that simple. <laughs> Overall, when you, when you start looking at this, it, it's true, right? Like it, it, it's generally just, this is true and it makes a lot of sense, but there, there's more to these things than just that. And, you know, one of the things that I found too, to be true is, is your soul appears to be the entity or the, the part of your being that is like in charge, like making the decisions, okay? You, you do things through the spirit, you do things through the body, right? But your body is not autonomous doing its own thing. Your body has lusts, desires, the, the, the things of the flesh that your body wants to do, but it's not just in charge, right? And you have a spirit that wants you to do spiritual things, but it's not just in charge either, but we have a soul. Like the soul is kind of like the brain of, of our consciousness. The soul is also what I would say is kind of like who you are. Right? So when we talk about what we see, the soul is often used in place of just like a person. I think, you know, this example is actually not even in my notes, but you remember the, the, the parable of the rich guy that had all of his goods right? And he tore down his barns and he, and he built more because he had so much abundance. And he was speaking to himself. He's like, soul, you have so much good. You know, eat, rest, be merry. You know, he's going to build up barns and all this other stuff. So, but, but he speaks to himself and he's talking to his soul in reference to himself, right? So it's just like one example there. Um, and again, it's going to be hard. Like I'm going to be saying, making statements like I just did in this opening, it's too much to go through the volume of scriptures that, that kind of formulates this understanding because there's so many and because there's different contexts. So I'll, I'll just put it on you. I don't expect you just to believe me at face value, but when you do your Bible reading, just keep what I'm saying in mind and see if it matches up with what you see when you read the Bible, right? Because... It is kind of an exhaustive study, and we'll take some time to do it, but it appears to me that the, the soul would be that, that part of our being that's like, it's who you are, right? Oftentimes, we're all soul winning, we talk to people like, hey, like this body, that's not who I am, right? We could talk to people that have different skin color and different characteristics about their physical body. That doesn't really matter because it's who you are on the inside. It's who you are as a person that really matters, right? So like the, the vessel that we are in, it is part of us, no, no doubt, right? This is part of who I am, but it's not that important part. It's a part that I need in order to do things in this world and, and to, to do all the physical things I need and to eat and drink and do all that stuff. But it's not really where my personality comes from. It's not who I am. It's not where my character comes from. That is more in the soul, my consciousness, 
right? My self-awareness, knowing who I am and what I am, that's going to be contained in the soul, okay? And that, that, that is more just to do about, about me and those things. Now, turn if you would to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. And we, I have a lot of scripture to turn to. I'm, this is not going to be a short sermon tonight, but I will do my best to keep it, to cap it. I will cap it off, of course, at some point. Um, but I may not have you turn, I'm definitely not going to have you turn to all these different places that we're going to look at because I need to just kind of move quickly to get through all the scripture that I have to lay all this groundwork in this foundation. So, uh, one last point though about this soul, spirit, and body. It also makes sense that we have this three-part uh, creation because God consists of three parts also. Now, it's slightly different, of course, because we are one person, but we are made up of body, soul, and spirit. And we're made in the image of God, right? And there's a lots of ways where God um, brings his truth into this world about who he even is uh, and, and, and has many trinities in different areas of his own creation. And we are, in a sense, a little trinity, a mini trinity of body, soul, and spirit, right? Making up one whole person. Whereas, of course, God exists as Father, Son, Holy Spirit, right? So we have similarities there. But the difference with God is God, that's, I mean, that's three persons, one God. We're one person with three parts. Make sense? But, but we're, we're, we're this reflection, a much inferior reflection, but a reflection of the Lord, of our creator, the fact that we have those three parts. So that kind of makes sense. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse number 9, the Bible says, But as it is written, I hath not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. But God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit. For the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. For what man knoweth the things of a man, save the Spirit of man which is in him? Even so the things of God knoweth no man but the Spirit of God. Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God, which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. But he that is spiritual judgeth all things, yet he himself is judged of no man. For who hath known the mind of the Lord, that he may, inst that he may instruct him, but we have the mind of Christ. Now, it's important just to bring this out right now as we look at 1 Corinthians chapter 2. The body and the soul, there's really no difference between a regenerated man and an unregenerated man. Saved man, unsaved man, right? Because a saved person, your soul doesn't change. Neither does your flesh yet, right? Like as we exist right here on this earth. But your spirit does because your spirit is born again. And we'll get into that in, ju in just a minute, okay? But the unregenerate, the unsaved man, they're not born again, but they still have a spirit. Now, their spirit is dead, but it still exists. And this is going to be a really important concept. I'm, I'm, I don't want to get too far ahead of myself, but your spirit is there. And like I mentioned before, the unsaved people, they still do spiritual things because they have a spirit. Now their spirit is dead, but it's still there. It's still part of who they are. We can only understand the things of God, the true God, the real God, when we are born again and we have of his spirit to help us to discern and understand the word of God. So we, I go to this passage because it clearly tells us, look, the natural man doesn't receive the things of God. And this is very strong evidence that our spirit is spiritual in, in the sense that we kind of toss around and use a lot because it's us dealing with God and specifically for the saved person and you know for anybody you can't understand the true things of God unless you are born again because it's spiritually discerned you, you just can't understand these things in the flesh your soul's not going to be able to understand them either you, it needs to be spiritually discerned 
So having a living soul or living, excuse me, living spirit that's born again is going to give us that communion with the Lord, the understanding, the communication to be able to understand, to hear him and um, to, to pray and, and have your prayers heard and things like that. So um, that's what we can learn from 1 Corinthians chapter 2. And, and clearly it's a spiritual thing. And like I said, there's so many passages about spirit. We can't go into all of them, but as you read through it, you can check and see that like, yeah, when it's talking about the spirit, it's talking about spiritual things. One, it could be talking about just the Holy Spirit, which is, which is a lot of references. One, it could be, ta another thing could be talking about different types of spirits, like spirit of jealousy, spirit of anger, spirit, you know, all these other types of things that they call a spirit. Not your actual spirit itself, but when it's talk referring to like your spirit, it's always in relation to something to do with your communication with God or service to God. So um, just, just to point that out. Now, I'm going to read through some of these verses about um, the soul and the body and not conflating those two things either. Because there is a group, I forget who it is now, if it's the Jehovah's Witnesses or one of the cults. One of the cults just basically tells you like your soul and your body, it's like the same thing. And I haven't talked to anyone about this for a long time, so it hasn't come up in a while. I, I, for, I forget who it is that, that believes this. But like Genesis 2, verse 7, the Bible says, and, and the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. So what, what people do is they'll say, like, see, look, man is just this flesh. But then he made that flesh a soul, like a living soul. Like that's how they see this or interpret this is just like, see, the flesh becomes a soul. No, 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 no. He, he became a living soul because God breathed the breath of life into him. Which, which, by the way, another point to remember when we're looking at the usage of the word spirit is like the literal, what does it even literally mean? And that has to do with your breath. So we believe that the, that, that, the Bible is inspired because it's God breathed. And, and the spirit oftentimes you'll notice is tied in with your breath. Okay, the just that like like that physically is what the spirit could be referring to, other than our actual spirit that's part of who we are. So when God we see here the three parts in Genesis chapter two, flesh formed out of the out of the ground the spirit being breathed into them and then becoming that living soul. So God made him a living soul, gave him the spirit and the body. So there's the three parts being created there in Genesis chapter 2. Um, a couple examples here of, of souls not necessarily referring to what's inside of you, but just as a person in general, Exodus 12, 4 says, And if the household be too little for the lamb, let him and his neighbor next unto his house take it according to the number of the souls. Every man according to his eating shall make your count for the lamb. So it's the number of souls that are in your house, the number of people in your house, right? I mean, it's very basic English understanding, but we've got to point out that this exists as a usage of the word Soul. Verse uh, Leviticus 5, verse number 2 says, Or if a soul touch any unclean thing, whether it be a carcass of an unclean beast, or a carcass of unclean cattle, or the carcass of unclean creeping things, and if it be hidden from him, he sh also shall be unclean and guilty. Or if he touch the uncleanness of man, whatsoever uncleanness it be, that a man shall be defiled withal, and it be hid from him when he knoweth of it, then he shall be guilty. So it says, if a soul touches or if he touches, he, he, you know, he's a person. And think about that. A soul is more of a, of a spiritual thing, right? Like, like not physical. It's not using the flesh and bone. So how could a soul touch anything? Obviously, it's referring to the person, right? Now, just because we have those passages that use a soul and a person interchangeably doesn't mean that the soul is the body, We've got to use some discernment here of what the Bible's saying. And, and there's many ways in which you can use a part of something to just be talking about the whole thing. So what's a good example of this? Um, 
Hey, how about this? Like nice threads. What am I talking about? I'm talking about his clothing, right? Not just the actual like thread or, or what, what was the one you said? Oh, get, get your rear end over here. Like, it, it's true. It's a good, it's a good example. So that's say, like, you obviously want the whole person to go there, but you were just referring to that part of them. Right? You, but you're, you're referencing everything. You see, I'm talking about like this, just referencing a part is, is commonly used in language. So I don't want to spend too much time on that because I think you get that. It's pretty, pretty, pretty self-explanatory. Now, the definition of death really matters for understanding this concept too. They really go hand in hand. And I'll read a few things for you, but basically when, when, a, when a body dies, the soul and the spirit depart from the body. Like that just, that happens certainly. And we have scriptural evidence for that as well. Genesis 35, 18, the Bible says, and it came to pass as her soul was in departing. And then it says in parentheses, for she died. Because she died, her soul was in departing, that she called his name Benoni, but his father called him Benjamin. Right? So someone is dying, their soul is departing. 1 Kings 17, verse 21 says, And he stretched himself upon the child three times and cried unto the Lord and said, O Lord, my God, I pray thee, let this child's soul come into him again. And the Lord heard the voice of Elijah, and the soul of the child came into him again, and he revived. And that word revived means he was brought back to life. That, you know, those of you that know Spanish, that vivir is to live, right? It's the same root, the same Latin root of this word revive here in English to be brought back to life again is literally what happened. And what happened when he was brought back to life, his soul came back in his body. But not just his soul. The Bible says in James 2 verse 26, for as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. So when your spirit's departed, it's also part of the definition of death, right? So someone physically dies, their soul and their spirit departs from their body, leaving the body alone. Revelation 1, verse 17. So why is this important? Well, partially, Jesus is someone who was dead. The Bible says in Revelation 1, 17, And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead, and he laid at his, his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not, I am the first and the last. I am he that liveth and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And have the keys of hell and of death. And, and I, I know I'm, I hope you can follow me on this, and it's not something that's super complicated, but it is important because what people commonly think of as death is like ceasing to exist. A lot of people just have the, the physical death as their only understanding of death, right? And, and not that it's real complicated, but, but really, you know, when a body dies, they say, well, I never see that person again. They're just gone. They go away. And on one hand, yeah, that is, that is part of what death is about, but not really so much in Scripture when we're talking about people who are dead. It, it's not as much even, like, it definitely is referred to, again, check the context, People dying physically are referred to as being dead in Scripture, but there's more than just that, right? What, what death is really about, death can still have consciousness, and people can still be referred to as dead. So not just gone completely, like we would think a physical body has no consciousness, right? That body is dead. But a soul or a spirit being dead is not the same as the body that's just inanimate, right? A soul or spirit that's considered dead still exists and is still there and, and is still conscious. And that's why it's important to know as we're talking about body, soul, spirit, hey, what about people who are unsaved? Their spirit's dead. Yeah, but the spirit's still there. The spirit still exists. The spirit could still be, right? And it is, it is around, but, it can, but it's still considered dead, okay? Jesus is, he says, I am he that liveth and was dead and behold, I'm alive forevermore. Amen. And have the keys of hell and of death. And the fact that he was dead, it's, it's obviously physically he died, but he wasn't just de like dead uh, in the, in, with his body in the tomb. He was dead because his soul descended into hell, the place of death where the dead are. 
The Bible says in, of course, Psalm 16, 10, for thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. And this is quoted again in Acts chapter 2, which clearly illustrates that that verse is talking about the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in hell. So when Jesus was dead, he was truly dead in all senses of the word for those three days and three nights. Does that mean he ceased to exist? No. I mean, I've heard people scoff at that and say, well, how could God die? It's because they don't understand what death means. Because they think that dead means you cease to exist. No, but and, I mean, really, nobody ceases to exist. Nobody does. There is, I mean, to, to bring up physics, there is this conservation of energy. There's this conservation even of matter. Nobody ceases to exist. People who die and go to hell, they still exist. They're in a real bad place. But they're conscious. And people who die and go to heaven, of course, they continue to exist as well. But the Bible defines those places. You know, if you're in hell, you're dead. And if you're in heaven, you're alive. Yeah. You have life versus death. So it's, you know, it, it, it's really good to have the right understanding of the word. That, you know, what is the definition in the Bible? It is not cease to exist. It is not. Romans 7 verse 8 says this, But sin, taking occasion by the commandment, wrought in me all manner of concupiscence, for without the, sin, excuse me, without the law, sin was dead. For I was alive one, without the law once. But when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. And the commandment, which was ordained to life, I found to be unto death. For sin, taking occasion by the commandment, deceived me and by it slew me. Wherefore, the law is holy, and the commandment holy, and just, and good. Was then that which is good made death unto me? God forbid. But sin, that it might appear sin, working death in me by that which is good, that sin by the commandment might become exceeding sinful. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. And this is how everybody that is born is alive without the law once. Children are born in this world innocent, and they're born with a body, a soul, and a spirit. Now, without the law, without the understanding of right and wrong, without, without having any of that, their spirit is not dead just as much as Adam's soul was, or spirit, excuse me, was still alive, and he was good, and him and Eve were fine in the garden until sin. They were fine. They didn't need to be saved until they sinned. Just like every human being does not need to be saved until they're guilty of sin. And I'm not going to get into all of the, you know, all of the details of that with, you know, with, with the age of accountability because there's a point in time where God is going to start holding people accountable for their sins and, and that is outside of the scope of the sermon. But the fact that the Bible says Romans 7, look, I was alive once without the law, but when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. Right? As soon as you become aware and you know you're doing wrong, there's a commandment against you, now you're guilty, and now because of the law, hey, you're dead. You're dead spiritually. You're not dead physically, which is exactly what happened to Adam. Genesis 2.16, about as the Lord commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it, for in the day that thou eatest thereof thou shalt surely eat die. And of course, the devil wants to confuse things, and he goes to Eve, and he says, well, you're not really going to die. You're not surely going to die. But he said you're surely going to die. Amen. And if God said it, it's true. Now, here's what, ha what, it, what happened. Well, Eve and Adam both ate of the tree. Genesis 3, 6 says, one woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise. She took of the fruit thereof and did eat. And gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. And we keep reading the story, they don't fall over, drop dead physically. They didn't do it. But what did God say? He says, in the day you eat thereof, you're surely going to die. So either God failed at his, what he said and what came out of his mouth, or what he said wasn't talking about their physical death. The latter is true. Right? Because he wasn't talking about their physical death. Because in the story, 
they hide themselves, they make themselves aprons, they're trying to cover up themselves and everything else after they get this knowledge, they didn't fall over and drop dead physically. They continued, but they did die. They died spiritually. Their spirit died. That separated them, that, that good relationship with God, that broke their standing. Now sin is brought into this world and they've got a problem and they need to be born again. Just like everyone else throughout history then that followed after there. And like the Bible says, hey, it may not be after the same similitude, the same sin that Adam made, but everyone has their own sin. And of course, I'm paraphrasing, but, you know, the Bible says look, we all have our own sin. It doesn't have to be Adam's sin that he did. You got your own sin. And that's what causes you to be unsaved. And that what causes you to where you're alive without the law once, but then, boom, you sin, you break the law, and now your spirit dies. But it's still with you. Revelation chapter 20, we see references to those that are not in the book of life are called the dead. Those that aren't alive or dead, I know it's, it's complicated stuff, but when we're even talking about things like Jesus died for every man, he was truly dead. It wasn't just a physical death. Revelation 20, verse 11, And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. And the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books, according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged, every man, according to their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever is not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. The dead are standing before God. They're conscious. They're being judged. God's, God's going, opened up the books, which I believe is the books of the Bible, the books of his law, the books that says like, hey, you're guilty of this, 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 this. This is where you're judged. They're conscious. They're aware. They understand what's going on. But they just came out of hell. Yeah. Because they've been conscious there too. Just like Luke 16 talks about the, the, the rich man. It says, in hell, he lifted up his eyes. And he's having a communication. He's talking to Abraham. And he's, you know, he's aware. He's like, hey, I'm being tormented by this flame. Can, can someone help me out here? Because he's conscious. He knows what's happening. And that's clear throughout Scripture as well. But they're referred to as dead. And just like Jesus said, hey, you know, when, when, when you're like, well, you're not even 40 years old yet. And have you seen Abraham? He says, before Abraham was, I have. Because he said, why? Because he said, Abraham rejoiced to see my day. Yeah. Why? Because Abraham's alive. God's not the God of the dead, but of the living. So having the, this is a, a very important understanding then to help us even just understand our own spirit, soul, and body. Okay? And, and what actually happens. Now, the spirit... Not only is it our communication with, with the Lord, kind of that, but, but the Spirit, over and over again, what you're going to see is the Spirit gives you life. Which is why those that don't have the Spirit are dead. Those that have a dead Spirit, they're dead. And those that have a live Spirit are alive. Because the Spirit gives life. And this is something you will find consistently through Scripture. Now, of course, there's the Spirit of God that gives us eternal life. But even our Spirit gives us life. That's the life-giving part of our body, of, of who we are. John 6:63 6, says this, and I'm just going to blow through many of these verses. Uh, it is the spirit that quickeneth. Quickeneth means made alive. This is a spirit that makes you alive. It's a spirit that quickeneth. The flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. Yes. Amen. 2 Corinthians 3, 6 who also hath made us able ministers of the New Testament, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter killeth, but the Spirit giveth life. The Spirit is where the life comes from. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 45, And so is written, The first man, Adam, was made a living soul, and the last Adam was made a quickening spirit. Right? The natural man, Adam, yeah, we have the image of Adam. He was made a living soul. He was made a natural man. That's going to die. But the second Adam from above is the Lord Jesus Christ. He was made a quickening spirit, and the spirit gives us that life. 
That's the Spirit's job is to provide the life. Which is why people that are unsaved, that don't, their spirit is dead, they have the soul, they have the body, right? But they're going to go to hell because they don't have life. They don't have the spirit. Which makes sense because the life that we get is from God. It makes sense that the spirit is going to be a, a religious type of a thing, right? Communion with God. So you see how that all kind of fits together and makes sense? Hebrews 4.12 says this, For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Now, this is talking about the word of God, obviously, the Bible, God's word. It's quick, which means alive, and it's powerful, and it's very, very sharp. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. And it's so sharp, right? You think about something that's real sharp, someone might get like a, like a, a hair and be like, see, look, I could, I could split this hair in two. Like that would be like, wow, that's really sharp. You just cut through that. Well, the word of God is a lot sharper than that. And, and the reference it gives to how sharp the word of God is, it says it's piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit. Okay, now, one, this shows me our soul and spirit have to be like really tied together tightly, right? They're bound. Like that's, it's part of who we are. Our spirit, our soul, like no one here can, can ever just be like, oh, I'm just going to take my, my spirit out for a walk. You know, people have this astral projection and stuff. And they think they're like, oh, I'm just going to be walking around outside of my body and all kinds of weird things like that. But look, you, you can't just take your, you, you can't do that. You're bound, right? Like we, we have this, this physical habitation we're bound by and our spirit and our soul are, are really tightly knit together. Now, but God's word it's able to split the soul from the spirit. Okay, that's how, that's how um, sharp the word of God is. But it, and then it also says, and of the joints and marrow. So it's likening the soul and the spirit to the joints and the marrow. And a joint, I think everyone knows what a joint is here on their body, right? Like, like anywhere you got two bones come together, they make a joint, right? So we got a lot of them here, and the older you get, the, the more they start to hurt. We have these, these joints, it becomes increasingly, yes, I know where my joints are, right? But um, the marrow, you may or may not know, and again, I am not an expert in this area, but uh, the marrow is, is found inside your bones, right? And the marrow is what kind of provides the sustenance or the life and brings the blood to your bones, in order to have that healthy bone and for the bones to still continue doing their job and be fed, they need the marrow. And it's interesting because the scripture here refers to the dividing of soul and spirit. Soul is mentioned first to the spirit as um, then the joints and the marrow and the marrow is that what brings the life. So I would say the, mar the marrow is like the spirit and the joint is like the soul. Right, and the bone would be like the flesh, and that's what's being described here as uh, is that type of a relationship, and as a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. And I'm not going to get into that. Let's just keep keep going here. So I, I want to keep on throwing all these verses at you to, to just to help prove that what what I'm trying to teach here is is correct. We see this in Scripture, and um, just to help give you a, a good understanding between the two, and and see that again, the soul and the spirit are not the same thing. Because if you could separate the two, clearly they can't be the same thing. Um, some verses on the soul that I think are, are relative or at least representative of um, what you'll find in Scripture. And again, will also illustrate the relationship aspect between people, right? Um, Genesis 34, verse 3 says, And his soul clave unto Dinah, the daughter of Jacob. And he loved the damsel and spake kindly unto the damsel. Genesis 42, 21 says, And they said one to another, We are very guilty concerning our brother, in that we saw the anguish of his soul when he besought us, and we would not hear. Therefore is this distress come upon us. If we're referring to Joseph, right? And, and we can see just at least in these two examples 
of um, the soul being used in these interpersonal type of relationships, the anguish and the things going on with the soul. Um, as I mentioned before, your soul seems to be tied into your personhood, like who you are as a person, and your consciousness, your self-awareness, as well as your decision-making. Uh, I'm going to read for you uh, from Leviticus 26, 14. The Bible says, But if you will not hearken unto me and will not do all these commandments, and if ye shall despise my statutes, or if your soul abhor my judgments, so that you will not do all my commandments, but that you break my covenant. So God is, is warning them, saying, look, if your soul abhors my judgments, because you, you choose whether or not you're going to listen to God or not. And this is, we see the responsibility of like, hey, if, you, if your soul is, is abhorring my judgments, then he's going to do this, this, and this. Uh, Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 29, the Bible says, but if from hence, from, excuse me, from thence, thou shalt seek the Lord thy God, thou shalt find him, if thou seek him with all thy heart and with all thy soul. And we're going to see, here, and here's an example as I was doing my study. You know, I saw heart and soul, heart and soul, heart and soul a lot. But then you know what else I saw? Spirit and, and heart, heart and spirit, heart and spirit, heart and spirit. So like, you know, if you're going to study out something like this, be exhaustive with the search. So you're not making too many connections that aren't necessarily there. And also be careful not to make a, a, a doctrine based on what's not there either, right? We, we want to form our opinions on what we actually see, not what we don't see. Um, Deuteronomy 6, 5 says this, And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart and with all thy soul and with all thy might. And that commandment is, is referenced multiple times in Scripture or like kind of stated slightly different ways, but, but it's always talking about your soul um, you know, and I would say this, you say, yeah, but I thought the Spirit's the one that, that has that communion with God. Yeah, but your soul's deciding whether or not you're going to do something, whether or not you're going to obey the commandments, whether you're not going to love God. Yeah. Right? So, so you, you're being told this, hey, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might, and with all your strength, right? That's, that's uh, the commandment for you. Now, clearly your soul and your body are bound together tightly. Um, Let's see, what else we got here? Deuteronomy 14, 26 says, And thou shalt bestow that money for whatsoever thy soul lusteth after, for oxen, or for sheep, or for wine, or for strong drink, or for whatsoever thy soul desireth. And thou shalt eat thereof before the Lord thy God, and thou shalt rejoice thou in thine household. 1 Samuel 18, 1, And it came to pass, when he had made an end of speaking unto Saul, that the son of the soul, excuse me, the soul of Jonathan was knit with the soul of David, and Jonathan loved him as his own soul. And again, we see that interpersonal relationship there. Their souls were knit together, right? Just, just another example. And, and I'm sorry, I'm trying not to bore you tonight, but, but it's the best way I know how to teach this truth is for you to see this for yourself from Scripture. Psalm 19, verse 7, The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. And, and ultimately, you know, your soul is going to decide whether or not you're going to put your trust in Jesus Christ and for your spirit to then be regenerated. Uh, Psalm twenty-two twenty-nine 29 says, All they that be fat upon earth shall eat and worship. All they that go down to the dust shall bow before him. And none can keep alive his own soul. You can't keep alive your own soul. You need the spirit to keep your soul alive. Um, I already, we already talked about death, but the souls in hell. We always read about souls in hell. You never read about like spirits in hell. And the closest thing you might be able to say about any of that, well, Jesus preached to the spirits in prison. But it doesn't say hell. Okay, and, and that's a whole other subject I'm not going to get into. But that, that was the only thing that even came to my mind before even just literally going through like, like all these verses that I had to reference here, you're always going to find out that there's souls in hell. Why? Because the Spirit's dead. Yeah. The Spirit's not doing anything for anyone in, in hell. Mm -hmm. You are, now, now you will find flesh in hell, and we'll get to that verse in just a minute. That's coming up. But it's always, you're always reading about souls in hell. Uh, Psalm 86, verse 13, For great is thy mercy toward me, 
and thou hast delivered my soul from the lowest hell. So, um, Proverbs 23, 14, thou shalt beat him with the rod and shalt deliver his soul from hell. Proverbs eleven thirty, 30, the fruit of the righteous is a tree of life and he that winneth souls is wise, right? We do soul winning. Why? Because we're trying to win those souls over to Christ so they don't die and go to hell. Because if you die without Christ, your soul is going to hell. Isaiah 38, verse 16, the Bible says, O Lord, by these things men live, and in all these things is the life of my spirit. Now, again, the life and the spirit being tied together. So wilt thou recover me and make me to live. Behold, for peace I had great bitterness, but thou hast in love to my soul delivered it from the pit of corruption, for thou hast cast all my sins behind thy back. So receiving forgiveness of sins, obviously is clearly talking about that pit of corruption is talking about hell. He's saying the reason why, you know that, why? Because you've cast all my sins behind me, you've forgiven me of my sins. So you've delivered my soul from the pit of corruption. Matthew 10, 28, here's the reference I was talking about. And fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Because at the resurrection of the just and the unjust, the resurrection of the unjust that's, you know, in Revelation 20, there's, that's why there's the dead being brought forth from the sea and all these other places, not just hell. Why? Because their bodies are being brought forth. And there's this reunion of soul and body that will then continue in the lake of fire forever. Where there, and that's why you can see, like, where the worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched. Well, what's the worm? If the worm's going through their... They're dead flesh. They're dead flesh that's going to remain, but they don't have a spiritual body. Right? Because they don't have the spirit. The spirit's dead. And again, I, maybe I said, it's not that they don't have a spirit. Their spirit's dead. It provides no life for them whatsoever. The spirit brings life. Hebrews 10, 39 says this, but we are not of them who draw back unto perdition, but of them that believe to the saving of the soul. 1 Peter 1, 9, receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls. Right? So over and over again, we see the deliverance from hell, that salvation is talking about your soul. Your soul is saved. Now, uh, references about the spirit. And I mentioned before, there's a lot that I'm leaving out. And I tried to make a list, and this is definitely not complete because I was going through some of this. The Bible talks about the Spirit of God a lot, okay? But that's not necessarily relevant to, to us being comprised of, of body, soul, and spirit. It talks about the Spirit of wisdom. It talks about the Spirit of fear. It talks about the Spirit of jealousy. It talks about the Spirit of sleep. It talks about the Spirit of judgment. It talks about the Spirit of prophecy. It talks about the Spirit of truth. It talks about the Spirit of error. It talks about the Spirit of meekness, okay? Now, the spirit is, is tied into also, besides just giving life, kind of your will and, and, and what you're going to do. And, and, and it works hand in hand with your soul, right? But they're not exactly the same. And this is why um, all of this being said, as much as I'm trying to provide clarity on this subject, there's only so much I can provide because it's still, at least to me, somewhat of a mystery on how everything just works perfectly together. I don't feel like this is a doctrine you could just get absolutely nailed down to have all of the answers on like how everything exactly is going to fit together and work. I mean, maybe it could be done with more knowledge that I don't have. Okay, and it's I liken this similar to even understanding the Trinity which, hey, great is the mystery of godliness that God was manifest in the flesh. Do I understand every single aspect of that? No, absolutely I don't. There's a lot of things I don't understand about how God can be, become a man and how he can put on the flesh and, and have even limitations to himself. Some, you know, like, like I don't understand how all of that works. I believe it. It's true. Yeah. The Bible says it's true, and, and it absolutely has to be. I just don't fully comprehend how it can, all the ins and outs of how that can work. Okay, but such is, and we're given enough information that we need to know about. And here I would, I would similarly say, like, I can't just deliver, oh, this is exactly soul, this is exactly spirit, this is, you know. Flesh is a little bit easier, but, you know, the, the, the inner workings of our soul and spirit, there seems to be a little bit of, of overlap there. 
But the Bible talks about these different things. A faithful spirit, a hasty spirit, a, a haughty spirit, a humble spirit, a meek and a quiet spirit. Right? But that's how you're carrying yourself and stuff, but it's not necessarily your spirit. Right? You could walk in a spirit of, of pride and of, of, of haughtiness. Or you could walk in a spirit of, it's, it's a manner. It's a manner of, of, you know, but that's what it's being referred to as not your spirit. But it's a common usage in Scripture, and when you search this out, that's what you're going to find a lot of these references. Um, and, and even talking about people like losing their spirit. So we read about, the, especially in the Old Testament, the, the, the battles, and they, they lost their spirit. What does that mean? They lost their will to fight. Like they just, they were deflated. They lost their, they're just like, oh, right? They're, they're defeated. They, they don't have that will to keep going anymore because they just feel like they're done. Um, and it's referred to as losing your spirit. And look, this is common language that we use again today. Um, Genesis 5, uh, 45, 27 is a good example of that. It says, And they told him all the words of Joseph, which he had said unto them. And when he saw the wagons which Joseph had sent to carry him, the spirit of Jacob, their father, revived. So his spirit came back. He, he was really down. He hears about Joseph, and he sees everything. He's like, oh, okay, he is alive, because he didn't believe him at first. Judges 15, 19 says, But God clave in hollow place that was in the jaw, talking about uh, Samson, and there came water thereout, and when he had drunk, his spirit came again. Again, this makes sense, because the spirit brings that life. right? So when your life force is abating, that, that part of you that, that is your life, your spirit needs to be revived to give you that strength again. Not your soul, your spirit. So when he was receiving what he needed, that little bit of water to bring him back to life, his spirit revived within him and came back again. Uh, 1 Samuel 30, verse 12, the Bible says, And they gave him a piece of, cake, of a cake of figs and two clusters of raisins. And when he had eaten, his spirit came again to him, for he had eaten no bread nor drunk any water three days and three nights. And that's, of course, talking about King Saul, when he fasted for three days and they gave him food and then he just came back. What, what came back though? His spirit revived. His spirit came back. I might skip over this a little bit. Yeah, I'm running out of time here. All right, this is a good point. So let's... Uh, Proverbs 25, verse 28. Sounds like a big problem. We better get connected to the internet. <laughs> Proverbs 25. Look at, look at Proverbs 25, 28. I'll read for you from Proverbs 20, verse 27. The Bible says, The spirit of man is the candle of the Lord, searching all the inward parts of the belly. Your spirit shows... It's kind of a, a glimpse into you and shows everything about you. It's God's candle to see inside of you. Verse uh, tw 28 of Proverbs 25, the Bible says this, He that hath no rule over his own spirit is like a city that is broken down and without walls. And this is where I was talking about before, about the, the soul kind of like being in charge, right, over your spirit. The Bible says that the... That the um, the spirit of the prophets is subject unto the prophets, right? So there's obviously something besides the spirit that's just ruling. Now, we ought to walk in the spirit, but again, that's a choice. We could walk in the flesh, we could walk in the spirit. The spirit's the right way, the flesh is the wrong way. We have both. We want to walk in the, in the spirit as much as possible, but we have this rule over our spirit that we need to, to make sure that we are than choosing to walk in the Spirit. Um, so if I'm going to sum all of this up here. There's one uh, place. Well, there's two places, two things that are worth mentioning. Let's, let's look at Ecclesiastes 3 first. Or I'm sorry, Ecclesiastes 12.
And I, I want to bring this up. I'm a little on the fence on, on, on what I think about this, but I want to bring it up anyways. I think it's worth mentioning. Uh, and just specifically just about this one verse in Ecclesiastes 12. Now, it's clear that the most we see in hell is, is soul and body. We never see references to spirits in hell. Just, it just does, it's just not there. Okay, souls go to hell. But we do know that this, when the soul and the spirit depart, a person's body is dead. And we know that we have a spirit that's alive because right? we're born again. And, of course, a saved person, their soul and their spirit will still be joined together and go to heaven. And then one day we get a new body and we're back having a three-part being, right? Body, soul, and spirit, but they're all redeemed. They're all, um, you know, holy and will be with the Lord. And, of course, in heaven we're with the Lord. Now, what happens to the spirit of the unsaved when they die? It's still considered dead. Is that in hell with them? I don't know. Ecclesiastes 12, 6 says this, though. It says, Or ever the silver cord be loosed, or the golden bowl be broken, or the pitcher be broken at the fountain, or the wheel be broken at the cistern, then shall the dust return to the earth as it was, and the spirit shall return unto God who gave it. It's a good argument to be made that, that the, you know, the spirits of the unsaved, those dead spirits just return to God and their soul and their body is going to burn in the lake of fire for eternity. And I'm not opposed to that view because it, it seems like that could very easily just be the case. Um, but I also just feel like maybe there's something I'm not quite understanding just about what this verse is intended to mean. Also, um, either way, their spirit's dead. It's not alive. It's not providing any life. They're still conscious, they're aware because they have that soul, which is our awareness, but they don't have life. And then the other point I want to make is this, because this was something that I thought was kind of interesting that was, I was challenged on a while ago. Turn, if you would, to 2 Corinthians chapter 7. The very first verse we looked at in this study was from 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. And I didn't spend a whole lot of time on this point of the Spirit, but from 1 John, for the whole book of 1 John really, but 1 John chapter 3 specifically, um, we get the understanding that, you know, the new, about the new man and the new creature, it says, whatsoever is born, whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin, right? And that's stated clearly in Scripture. And how do we believe this to be true when we're still sinners, right? We still do things that are sinful. Well, if we believe as we do, like, well, hey, we have a soul that could choose whether or not we're going to walk in the flesh or walk in the spirit, right? And in, in that context, it's talking about the spirit. Why does, this, why, why do, why does whosoever um, is born of God doth not commit sin? Because uh, he's born of God and, and his seed remaineth in him, right? So the seed is the word of God that brings forth that new life which is what makes our spirit born again. So that part of us, that's, we have that new spirit that is born again, has the life and doesn't sin. Right? And this is a comment, I've taught this many times, a few times at least in the past here, that, that the spirit is the new man, it's, it's the regenerate man, it is the part of us that has that eternal life, and, and the spirit, of course, has a life. We have the life given from God. When we walk in the Spirit, when we walk in the new man, we are serving the Lord, we're doing what's right, and we walk in the flesh, we're not, right? Our soul is kind of making that decision back and forth. So then, if that's the case, this is what, what, what was challenged to me before, and, and I'll admit, I had a lot, uh, for a while, I didn't have a really good answer for this, I knew it wasn't, I knew the question was kind of faulty, but nonetheless, I didn't have a good answer for it. And in verse 23, where we started in 1 Thessalonians 5, you're in, you're in 2 Corinthians 7, but the verse says, And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly, like, you know, wholly, completely. And I pray, God, your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. So the question to me was, well, hey, if the spirit is sinless, 
right, and can't sin, then why would it need to be preserved blameless? That was a question, right? It's a fair question, right? So people are, you know, and we ought to be open to, to answering questions about our faith, right? Hey, what do you believe? And, and if you're wrong about something, then get it right. Now, right off the bat, though, when it's talking about being preserved blameless, we see the word blameless used in other contexts, and it's even referred to people who are not sinless. But it's just kind of a standard of living, like, like Job was blameless or Abraham could be blameless, right? They were just without blame. This isn't referring to any fact of like a part of your body being without sin. What, what I can see now, and especially after doing this study and just really thinking about it, we, everyone has the body, soul, and spirit. There's things that you do in your flesh, right? There's things that you can do um, with your soul in the, your inner communication with people. We ought to love our brethren. We ought to do these things that all these different commandments can, can uh, apply to, right? So loving your brother as yourself, it's going to have a little bit more to do with your soul. But the way that you love God and keep his commandments and keep spiritual purity is going to have to do with you know, not having any other gods before him and not uh, having any false idols and things like that, right? Now, because we're a sinner, we can do, we could commit a spiritual sin, right? Even though our regenerate spirit is without sin, we can still have what we consider like, like tarnishing your, your spirit because you're, you're committing, you're bringing your spirit through the mud, I was talking just briefly with Brother Devin before. It was just, you know, he brought up like a diamond is still a diamond, but if you, if you get it all dirty in, in, in the mud and stuff, right, that's, uh, that's, still, that's still pure, the purity of the diamond, but now you've kind of, uh, you know, just, just dirtied up that, that what's there. And we could do the same thing, a similar thing, you know, with our, with our spirit. Even though spirit's still without sin, hey, we want to be blameless in all areas of our life, in, in the physical sense, in the soul, and in the spirit, right? We know that the spirit's good and without sin. And we know that one day we're going to get a new body. But we want to be blameless in all of our areas of life. And this kind of sealed the deal for me when I read this in 2 Corinthians chapter 7 because it also references a filthiness. In verse number 1, the Bible says, Having therefore these promises... Dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit. So wait a minute, I'm saved. What do you mean filthiness of the spirit? Right? Same, same type of argument could be used here. Perfecting holiness in the fear of God. And when we read this verse, I'm going, okay, well, having therefore these promises, oh, wait, this is referring back. So right off the bat, this verse, verse, you have to get <laughs> the context goes back to chapter 6. Right? So let's tie in where this was coming from and see in context, what is this talking about filthiness of the flesh and spirit? Well, in 2 Corinthians 6, 14, which is written to save people, right? People who are church, people who have the new spirit, people who are regenerated. It says, be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness and what communion hath light with darkness and what concord hath Christ with Belial or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? And what agreement at the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God, as God hath said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you, and will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. And understanding the way that our soul and our spirit work, and, and just in general, we could do spiritual things and spiritual sins, you know, that's going to bring filthiness on our flesh and spirit. And as we see here, you know, getting involved with idols or eating that which is offered unto idols and that type of thing, that would be more of a spiritual sin because it has to do with, with you and your relationship with God. But it, it, it doesn't imply that the new man is, is not sinless. Does that make sense? I, I hope it makes sense just seeing that. Like this is, um, you know, and understanding how all parts of our body are kind of framed together and what their functions are will help us understand some of these smaller things. I would call it a finer point, right, of what we believe. Because here's the thing. 
you could look at a couple of these statements, and like I said, I wasn't too worried about the challenge because First Thessalonians 5.23 there's a little bit of ambiguity there, and in the way it's worded doesn't sound like it's something that's just as, as explicit as, say, 1 John 3 is. Right? 1 John 3 is extremely explicit. And, we're, and when we're looking at uh, getting our doctrine from Scripture, you've got to go with the clearest verses. Just be like, yeah, this is flat out exactly saying this. Versus things that are questions and, and other parts of Scripture. So, I don't know. I, I hope this helps with your understanding of how we are and were created. Um, as I mentioned, there's, there's, I, don't, I don't claim to have all the ins and outs and I can't nail everything down. And I don't think we ought to just be thinking like, wait, is that my soul? Is that my spirit? You know, like, like we don't need to get caught up with that. <laughs> At the end of the day, just do right and don't, don't get all worried about, about what part of your, of your body is doing what. Like, we, that's not that important. Just, just, Serve God, do right, and, and, and you'll be good, right? <laughs> You're already saved. You got the new spirit. Walk in the spirit as much as you can. So uh, let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Lord, uh, thank you so much for uh, making us the way that you did, for giving us the ability to, to know you and to communicate with you, commune with you, dear Lord, as well as our fellow man. And I pray that you would please just help us and increase our knowledge and our understanding and our wisdom of your creation, of us, of of um, of all around, all the things around us, dear Lord, and uh, just lead us in the in the way of truth. Help us to be able to reach other people and lead them to you. And it's in Jesus Christ's name we pray these things. Amen.